As a journalist, it's my job to bring the truth to the forefront. Making people aware of the truth is what I get paid for. I'm a freelance journalist who makes money by writing on my online blog and providing people with information that mainstream media is too reluctant to offer. Over the last two decades, the internet has become the most prominent part of our culture. But with the expansion of the internet, there are its dark traits as well. As a journalist for the last two months, I'm set on exploring the dark web and what all lies there. But with every passing day and every piece of new information I discover, I've started to doubt my quest altogether. For the past months, I've explored the part of the dark web that deals with drugs, weapons, smuggling of illegal things, human trafficking, and whatnot. But the part of the dark web that I have to explore even more is the paranormal section. In our day-to-day -day life, many people don't believe in these things. They brush it off and think things like they only exist in movies. But if you dive into the deepest parts of the dark web, you'll discover many unthinkable things. But a few nights ago, I made a very critical breakthrough. I was invited into an Illuminati forum. These forums are so exclusive that you can't enter without an invitation. Luckily, the time I had spent searching the dark web had taught me how to get invited into such extremely private forums. In these forums, some people practice black magic and worship Lucifer, or Satan as they call him. These people, like any other religion, have their own festivals and rituals. There are all sorts of people in these forums. The ultra-rich, who have got their fortune by worshipping the devil, as well as the poor and middle class, who wish to earn a fortune. I entered the forum as a person who wished to get initiated into the dark world and make my life prosperous. But what I discovered was... the stuff straight out of a person's nightmares. Most of the rituals revolved around human sacrifice. I wanted to do thorough research on this, so I decided to go with it anyways. I knew I might get into trouble, but I wanted to shed light on all the dark practices that are performed in these circles. I was soon contacted by the admin of the forum and asked why I wanted to join the forum, what I wanted in my life. Of course, I wasn't about to tell him that I wanted to expose them, so I told him I wanted to be a great journalist. He seemed to buy my lie and told me that there will be a ritual that will be performed by a witch on my behalf, which would get me my desired outcomes. The only catch was, I had to pay for the ritual beforehand. The amount was twenty-five grand. I didn't have that kind of money, but I was determined to find out what the ritual was, and I also wished to expose the sham. I asked my sister for some money, and after knowing the reason why, she gave it to me willingly. I transferred the money to the random account the admin had asked me to. Later that evening, I got a message instructing me to join a new forum called The Dark Place to watch the ritual being performed live on my behalf. I was eager to see what I would get in return for 25 grand, so exactly at 1 a.m. I logged into the forum. I was expecting it to be some kind of satanic ritual with pentagons and some animal blood and whatnot, but when the streaming began, I was seeing a basement that was converted into a makeshift operation theater. For instance, I thought I had joined the wrong feed, but soon a woman wearing a black mask appeared on the screen. She was in a black dress, and her long dark dreadlocks were tied in a bun above her head. Her face was only half visible, as the mask covered most of it, and her lips were painted red as if she had drunk blood before appearing on screen. So... You want to be the best journalist in the world, huh? She spoke into the camera to me. That's when I realized my camera was automatically turned on, and she could see me, too. Yes, was all I could say. Good, good. This ritual, or should I say, sacrifice, will give you all you want. Now, keep watching. And do not try to disconnect or stop it. I nodded my head as my eyes were glued to the computer screen. Soon, two hooded men carried a young girl and placed her on the operation bed. She was unconscious, looked like she was sedated. I had no idea what they were doing. I was mostly certain that they would kill her. But soon the masked woman appeared on the screen again and told me what she was about to do. This little miss here is pregnant. 
She wanted an abortion and contacted the hospital. But we have ties in the hospital and offered her ten grand to let us do the abortion and keep her fetus. A poor girl would not be able to support the baby anyways. So she agreed. <laughs> the woman walked back beside the young girl and started chanting a spell. I knew this was wrong, but I was recording the whole thing on my computer. These people were unaware of it. This would be my proof to expose these monsters. Soon, two doctors stepped in. Although they were dressed in scrubs, they were wearing pentagon necklaces. They began the process, and the masked lady started swaying and dancing around the bed on which the operation was going on. She was still chanting the spell, but it looked like she was possessed. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. Soon, the doctors completed the process and handed a lump of blood and flesh to the woman. She took it in her bare hands and put it in a pot. Then she angled the pot so that I could see what was going on clearly. She added some leaves to the pot and some sort of oil, and then lit the contents in the pot on fire. Although I was watching the whole thing through the screen, I could smell the burned flesh. Uh, you smell it, boy? The masked woman asked me. I just nodded my head once again. The ritual is done. <laughs> the woman announced, and my screen turned black. I had no clue what had just happened, and I knew for sure this was all fake. I didn't pay much attention and went to bed. The next day, my phone was buzzing with incoming calls as I woke up. It was a private number. As soon as I picked up the call, I got to know that it was from a recruiter who recruits journalists for The Times, one of the most prestigious news networks in our country. I wanted to get a secure job with them forever, but I was always rejected. But somehow, The Times was offering me a job on their own. I soon realized that it wasn't a coincidence. The black magic ritual had worked, and this was just the first step. I would truly become a successful journalist if I took up the job. So, what should I do now? Continue to expose the Illuminati cults on the dark web? Or forget all about it and join my new job and be successful? During the early 2000s, the internet's popularity and accessibility were booming. While in college, my friends and I would spend hours huddled around a computer screen browsing this new method of communication that was predicted to change the world. One evening, my college roommate asked me in a secretive whisper, despite living alone in her apartment, if I'd ever heard of the dark web. He explained the dark web was a secret side of the internet. No one could track, trace, or see any activity that went on there. He also explained it was a way of obtaining products that weren't exactly legal or obtainable elsewhere. So, how do we access it? That's the best part, he said, walking to my room. All you have to do is download some free software. We sat in front of my computer, downloaded something I'd never heard before, and we began our browsing. He navigated this side of the web with ease. I barely knew how to browse the regular internet, much less this dark and secretive version of it. He made an illegal substance purchase and smirked at me triumphantly as he shut down the computer. That's it? I asked. <laughs> That's it. Easy, huh? He gave me a thumbs up, indicating a successful and secretive transaction. It turns out that that wasn't it. The following week, I sat at my desk, ready to begin a research project. I opened my internet browser and began studying. My eyes flew through graphs and charts when, suddenly, the computer screen went dark. I assumed my monitor had overheated or the connection had malfunctioned. I rose from my chair to check when I noticed the screen wasn't entirely black. A cursor blinked on the screen. I stared and wondered if I imagined it. The cursor began typing, Hi, Brian, I see you. <laughs> I stared, unblinking and breathing heavily. Bye for now. My computer screen returned to the previous page as if nothing had just happened. I wondered if this had been a hallucination induced by sleep deprivation and stress, though deep down I, I knew it wasn't. I tried to push it aside and continue my work. <sighs> the next few days were normal, no more cryptic messages on my computer, but that's when the letter arrived. One evening as I arrived for work, I noticed the corner of a red envelope peeking under my doormat. 
Brian was written across the front. The back was sealed. I picked it up, looked around to see if anyone was watching, and entered my apartment. I ripped the seal open, blinded by adrenaline and fear. Dear Brian, it's nice to meet you. Though I feel I already know everything about you. Your mother is named Heather, your sister Michelle, and your father, Michael. You are 24 years old and were born in Madison, Wisconsin. You enjoy music by Metallica, horror movies, and eating Indian food. You spend too much money on coffee and alcohol. Your credit score is 540 because of your credit card debt. You have three pairs of shoes in your closet, ten clean shirts, and two pairs of jeans. I'll cut right to the chase. I request you send $10,000 to the address below. If you do not cooperate, I'll have to visit you. Trust me, you do not want that. You have two weeks. Ciao, Al. <clears throat> P.S. Going to the police will make all of this worse. Perhaps I'll need to visit your family if you do. My, my head flooded with questions and fears. How, how did he know all of this? Had he been inside my apartment? Was this a sick joke by my roommate? What did he mean by pay me a visit? What should I do? Huh. The next two weeks were hell. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't concentrate. Eyes followed me everywhere I went. Cars were tailing me. My roommate started acting oddly and reserved. My parents sounded afraid over the phone. My computer was slower than usual. Though, was I imagining everything? At the end of the two weeks, I decided not to send Al anything. This decision was derived mostly by my lack of $10,000, but I pretended to believe it was all a big scam. I came home from work Tuesday evening, exactly 14 days after receiving the letter. My roommate was spending the night at his girlfriend's place and I had the apartment to myself. I pretended not to remember what the night marked, but I was on edge. I tiptoed through and eyed every room, searching for abnormalities. There were none, until I entered my room. I cracked my room door open. My stomach dropped and goosebumps covered my skin. My room was destroyed. My computer was on the ground. My mattress was flipped. My posters had been torn to shreds. Everything that was on my desk was scattered throughout the ground. My eyes shifted to the closet door. It was open, though barely. I heard light movement coming from inside. I approached, body shaking and sweating. Suddenly, banging at my front door thundered, stopping me cold. The strikes intensified and were joined by the screaming of my name. Brian McDonald! Brian McDonald! Open up! Open up! I tried to digest what was occurring. What was the bigger threat? What looked in my closet or, or, or outside? I stood mulling my options over, but a loud crack and crash came from the living room. My door had been knocked down. At that moment, my closet door began to open. A tall, slender figure stepped out. He wore a clown mask and a full formal suit. He, he, he exited with a gun lifted in my direction. Hi, Brian, he said in a soft voice. I'm Al. Gun pointing at my head, continued... I'm sorry I have to do this, but I warned you that this would happen if you didn't fall. A gunshot rang, nearly busting my eardrums. I anticipated blood, anticipated pain, but, but they never came. Instead, Al's gun-wielding arm came down first, followed by his entire body. His lifeless figure landed at my feet as blood began to pool around his head. Brian McDonald, this is the NYPD. I need you to take a step back and come with us. Tears were now rolling down my face. I turned and saw a young man in uniform's arm stretched out, offering a hand. I extended mine, and he escorted me to the police station. At the station, Officer Harris explained, Al was a computer hacker terrorizing inexperienced dark web users for months. In that span, Al had blackmailed seven victims into sending him $70,000 and had brutally murdered another nine that had not complied. He kept to a 10-mile radius and only specific neighborhoods were targeted. The police recovered the letters and red envelopes of every victim and began connecting the puzzle pieces. They indicated they'd been following me for two weeks, going through my mail and tracking my internet browsing history. My internet searches regarding internet scams, internet threats, and the dark web led them to believe I, I was the next target. <laughs> they were correct, and they saved my life. It's been 17 years since that horrific day. I never browsed the dark web again, and while I hear it's still around, I'll never browse it again. Please, use this as a warning. 
While the police saved my life at the last minute, you may not be so lucky. Beware of the dark web. As someone who enjoys searching for the hidden, dark side of the internet, I was very interested in watching YouTube videos about Deep Web. Even though I was interested in the topic, I never found the courage to go in the Deep Web because I knew that serial killers, criminals, and all sorts of untrustworthy people would be there, and they could easily find my IP address as soon as I clicked on a website link. I knew that I should stay out of it, but when a friend of mine, whose name will not be given, came to my house to a sleepover, things changed. Let's call him Tom, even though that is not his real name. Obviously, I will not give my name as well, but you can call me Mia. Tom and I were really good friends. We were both into mysteries, crime stories, and biographies of serial killers. When he arrived at my house, we started to watch a documentary on Deep Web. We were both intrigued by the documentary. After we finished watching it, Tom told me that he would love to go into the deep web. I was scared to do that, and I knew I should have said no at that point, but I did not. Very foolishly, I said that we could try. His eyes sparkled with joy, and he rushed to my desktop. I joined him and we downloaded the browser that would make us be able to access the deep web. We found some links and went through them one by one. The first link was a website that was mainly about illegal trades of drugs and firearms. Even by entering this website, I felt the rush of adrenaline. Tom seemed to be a little bored. We opened the second link, which was also selling drugs, but also leather-made furniture. These furniture were made from a special leather that we instantly understood what it was. Human skin. Being someone who is aware of the dangers that comes just by entering the website, I felt the urge to close the computer, but Tom wanted to check out more links. On the third link, we saw a man with no legs. He had a mask of a very disgusting face. The mask had scars, big red eyes, and countless amount of teeth bursting out of the mouth portion of it. He was crawling in a dim room. The floor he was crawling on was filled with dried blood. He was making different kinds of animalistic sounds with his mouth. We watched him as he crawled to the door of the room. He knocked on the door. He seemed like he was trying to escape the chamber. He scratched the iron door. He screamed and asked for help. At that moment, the door opened and a huge man rushed inside the room. He beat the legless man senselessly. With pain, he crawled to a corner and held his head. He was rocking back and forth and crying. The giant man approached the camera. He had a ski mask on him. His white shirt was filled with blood stains. As he came closer to the camera, he started to mash on his keyboard in haste. After a while, he started to speak. His voice was distorted as he spoke. Oh, we have new visitors. Hello there. Let's see who is here with us. As he said those words, I saw the blue light on my webcam turned on. That meant the webcam was on. He continued to talk. How are you tonight, Mia? I see that you have a friend with you. He looks like he does not deserve you. At that point, Tom and I were both scared. Tom unplugged the webcam quickly, and we heard the man's voice once again. Oh, I cannot see you anymore. You looked scared. Do not worry. I just want to be your friend. Now, show me your faces again, please. Of course, we did not open the webcam. We should have closed the computer at that point. But we were petrified by the fear we were feeling. He seemed angry that we did not plug in the webcam. He began to shout and said, Fine. If you do not want to show me your faces, I will come and see. As I rushed to unplug the computer, I could hear him shouting curses and describing how he was going to torture Tom and rape me. I unplugged my computer. There was a moment of silence. We were looking at each other while panting intensely. I said, what was that? We are doomed. That was the kind of stuff that I was afraid of. 
in a panicked tone. That was really scary, he said, and started to laugh. I do not think he will do that. He is just a pathetic psycho who wanted to scare us. I do not think he will find us, he said while still laughing. You do not understand, Tom. The fact that he was able to open my webcam remotely shows that he's capable of finding our location. He seemed really angry at us. He will definitely come here and murder us. Tom did not seem to understand the true nature of the event that happened. He held me and very calmly said, I really do not think he will try to find us, Mia. But if you are afraid to stay here, you can come and live with me for a week. After a week, we can check and see if it's safe for you to live here, and you can come back to your house. Is that okay for you? I approved his plan and started to pack my stuff. After an hour, I finished packing and we left my house. At first, I was constantly thinking about what happened. For a couple of days, I was incapable of sleeping. Even the thought of him knowing my name was enough to keep me awake. But after I got used to living in Tom's flat, I seemed to not think about what happened that often. My relationship with Tom became something more than a friendship. The sexual tension found its result in the couple of days I spent in his place. This, I believe, was the main reason that kept me from thinking about the man constantly. A week passed and we were both happy that I was staying with him, but I started to miss being in my house. Considering the deal I made with Tom, it was time for me to go back to my place. When I told him, Tom understood and said that it was okay for me to go to my house. I left my clothes at his place, telling him that I'll be coming back. I left him and went to my home. When I arrived there, I noticed that my window was broken. I opened my door as fast as I could and started to look around. My house was a mess. My furniture was ripped into pieces. My mirrors were broken. Papers and any kind of belongings were scattered around the rooms. On the table, I found a letter. I opened the letter. It was from him. In the letter, he described how he came to see us but could not find us, how he stayed in my house for three days and searched for information, and how he found out mine and Tom's personal information. The letter ended with him stating that he was going to check Tom's address, considering he was not able to find us in my house. In a hurry, I called Tom. There was no answer. Hoping that he was okay, I called the police and gave his address. I left my house and started to drive to his address. I drove as fast as I could and arrived there. As I ran to his flat, I saw the door open. With a sudden rush of adrenaline, I went in his place. At that moment, I saw his body lying on the floor with dozens of knife wounds on his body. I found the knife next to his body. As I held his body and started to cry, I heard rushing footsteps coming from outside the flat. I instinctively held the knife, thinking the sound was coming from the man. I remember feeling relieved when I saw that the person who was rushing here was a police officer. I asked for help, but the cop, seeing me holding a knife and standing before a dead body, drew his gun and ordered me to freeze. I tried to tell them that it was a misunderstanding and I was not the killer but they did not listen. They took me to the police station and told what happened, but the evidence they found was telling a different story. They found my DNA all over his flat. They found my clothes, and most importantly, they found my fingerprints on the murder weapon. I will go on trial next week. I am not afraid of going to jail. What scares me the most is that the man is still out there hunting innocent people like Tom and me.